We're in Stockport tonight, and welcome to Question Time. And with us here this evening on our panel, Theresa May's right-hand man in the Cabinet, the First Secretary of State, Damien Green. Uh, Labour's Shadow Education Secretary, Angela Rayner. The businesswoman, former winner of The Apprentice, Michelle Dewberry. The professor of American Literature at the University of London, Sarah Churchwell. And the Daily Telegraph columnist and editor of The Spectator, Fraser Nelson. We've had, a, we've had a massive range of questions here in Stockport tonight. I'll try and get through uh, as many as we can, if you're what others are saying. So, let's kick off with this from Mark Emery, please. Mark Emery. Was the Tory party conference Theresa May's last stand? <laughs> right. Was the Tory party conference Theresa May's last stand, Angela Rayner? Well, I kind of thought that Theresa May had to perform at conference this time. It very much felt like, let's be honest, that... Jeremy Corbyn had his moment some time ago where he was given the opportunity and he had to prove himself. And I think Theresa May had the same situation this time and, and she faltered, unfortunately. And it wasn't the performance because the letters off the stage fell off or because somebody handed her a P45. All of those things were really unfortunate. But I think the fact that the sad fact that we've had seven years of Tory failure and that they're a pale imitation of the Labour Party now and they've run out of ideas is the exact reason why Theresa May has probably had her last stand and I absolutely agree. It's likely that they'll probably try and find a replacement but they just haven't found, they just don't know who they're going to have to replace at the moment. I saw more U-turns from Theresa May at the party conference than I'd seen on Top Gear, if I'm honest. So I think, you know, she's got a real tough time on her hands. Fraser Nelson. It was pretty excruciating, a speech you had to watch between your fingers. And it wasn't just the cough, you know, it wasn't just the sets falling apart. It was a pretty unimpressive conference from the Tories in general. It, for they felt like a, a party that thinks, OK, we tried to copy Labour policies, but it didn't work, so we need to defend the free market. But they couldn't quite work out what to do. We had stuff like energy price caps. That was nicked from Ed Miliband's manifesto. It felt like it, hadn't, it was leaving one agenda, but hadn't quite worked out what one to take. Now, I can't blame Theresa May for that entirely. The whole party is having a bit of an identity crisis right now. It had a general election that was a disastrous result in losing their majority. But Theresa May, to answer the question, no, it's not her, her last stand. The odds are she'll be standing for quite a while longer because the Conservatives do not have any better idea. They're worried if they have a leadership contest, they'll tear themselves apart. Boris Johnson's speech was um, were very well received, but Boris is not always the most popular person, even inside um, his own party. So, you know, the Tories are thinking to themselves, is it what's worse? Is it worse to keep Theresa May visibly weakened? Because, you know, a lot of leaders would have quit after the general election. But she is staying, not because I think that she wants to go on and on and on, because she knows she's got a duty to her party to hold it together until they work out what they want. And you kind of saw the resilience in a strange way on the stage there. If I, if right now, if I started to cough and clam up, I'd run straight out that door and cry. Yeah. Um, no, but, you wouldn't. You'd sit there. Oh, and, I don't and, know. And, I'm and, afraid to say. They, it's, you know, but, but she, she carried on, which is a kind of metaphor, a load of metaphors there, a metaphor yes. of what she's doing with her party. And she wants to try to take them to a slightly better place. And they've got to work out what they want to do after her, but they haven't decided now. OK. Mark Emery, you asked the question. What do you think? I think it's like watching an ongoing car crash at the moment. And we're in a situation where we've got two political parties, one to the left, one to the right. We've got a party that appears strong out of government and a party in government that appears weak. And do you think she's on the way out? Is it the, when I don't know, because I think, like the panel said, uh, there's no... Who, who are they going to have as a new leader? Okay. And if you're going to put someone in new, you need to put someone in strong. Damien, I'll come to you, but just let's hear from the woman up there. I'm not sure there's anybody good enough to replace her right now. Yeah. And that's why she's safe? Potentially. Damien Green? Um, I mean, the answer to the question is, is no, of course not. And... I've, I've read more 
rubbish and bad metaphors written in the last 24 hours uh, than for a long time. Uh, the idea that uh, so, you know, somebody gets a cold when they're at work, uh, that that somehow uh, renders them uh, the wrong person for the job, or even more, that because some unfunny pillock pulls a practical joke, uh, that that is in any way uh, an important political event is complete nonsense. And you know, the, the, the problem, the, the, the shame is that uh, the content of the speech uh, obviously got lost, uh, despite the fact that you know, with huge resilience uh, that she got through it. As, as Fraser said, that was exactly right. But actually, uh, having a speech which explained uh, what drives her, that she is still as driven to fight the injustices in society, things that people often don't expect to hear from a Conservative Prime Minister, and the fact that uh, next week we will be uh, publishing uh, the first ever race disparity audit, uh, which will mean that government will be able to get a much better grip on why uh, certain minority communities don't get on in this country. These are unexpected and good things to hear uh, from a Conservative Prime Minister, and I know that she's as determined as ever uh, to get on with the job. She sees it as her duty to do so, and she will carry on, and she will make a success of this government. Okay. What they what? <laughs> Isn't the sad fact that the reason why somebody thought it was okay to hand her a P45 during her speech was the fact that you're all in fighting and Boris Johnson was upstaging her prior to her speech? Well, as opposed and, to and, and, and I was going to say, can oh, well, I gently we're, we're remind not. you that 142 <laughs> Labour MPs uh, expressed no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn a few months and ago? And we've got. Think, all right. Okay. We've, we've got a shadow cabinet with a great get, manifesto. I'll come back. I, I, okay, you in blue there, yes. Angela, you've said about seven years of failed austerity, uh, just went through a general election three years ago, uh, three months ago. People rejected Jeremy Corbyn. Theresa May get a million more votes, literally. Um, Theresa May's got 60 more seats. A lot of the public actually voted for her to say that it's failing. It's what people want, is the Conservatives, obviously. I, I was interested in what uh, Fraser Nelson said. Uh, which I noticed Damien Green didn't pick up about the Tory party having kind of lost its way and, and fumbling. But I will come back to you. But Michelle Dubry, what do you think of um, the state of things? Well, it's, it's a bit of a mess at the moment, I think. Um, if there was a, gen a general election called literally tomorrow, I literally I have no one to vote for. I feel completely politically homeless at the moment. Um, <laughs> Do I think that Theresa May is, you know, she, this is her last standing? No, I don't. But I think that's for the reasons we've already gone over, which is who's going to replace her? I'm really worried that we're going to have a situation where you've got two choices, Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn, and I don't want either of those two people. Um, Just and... explain why you feel at sea, lost at the moment politically. Well, I'm somebody, um, I'm entrepreneurial, I've got ambition, I want to succeed. I don't think um, wanting success and, and wealth is a bad thing, but I don't want it at the expense of anybody else. And what I feel at the moment is there's nobody who is supporting kind of wealth creation, success, aspiration and ambition, but is equally supporting people that are struggling, that are not damaging and hurting people more than they're currently hurting. I don't want to go too far over to the Labour side because I'm not a fan of socialism and nationalisation, etc. I don't want to go over to the Tories because I don't like what they're doing. Well, when did you last feel like... happy? <laughs> when I voted for myself at the last election. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but, and you stood as an independent, didn't you? I, think. I did, yes. in my hometown, Hull. Yes, but the, the woman there, yes. Um, I just wanted to pick to up you. on Damien Green's point yes. that the content of her speech was lost. I don't think there was much great content there. She copied Ed Miliband's policy on energy caps. And to tackle the housing crisis, she's not really increased the supply of housing, but she has increased and inflated the demand by pumping another £10 billion in to help to buy. I don't think that's the way to solve the housing crisis. OK. And, and you. I'll come back to you. Yes. I totally agree with what Michelle's just said. I think the problem is we've got no strong leaders on both sides. And I think me, I've always been a Conservative um, voter. I'm a teacher, which is a bit unusual for, to be a Conservative voter. And this general election, I really struggled. I sat there and thought, actually, the policies on the Conservative side 
I totally didn't agree with lots of them because, like you say, they're not entrepreneurial, they're not going to sort the economy out. The ones on the Labour side were just totally unbelievably brilliant, but totally not being able to pay for them. Yeah. And I thought, well... <laughs> for Mickey Mouse or whether to vote for something that I've always believed in and I, I'm very much I'm one of those supporters that really Damien you need to make sure I vote for you next time and I think there's a lot of us about there who really are struggling yeah. I think it's interesting because I suspect that Michelle and I are on um, very different positions on the political spectrum on many questions, but like you, I also feel politically homeless right now. I'm not comfortable with either of the main party leaders. I'm someone who likes to see women in positions of leadership, and it, I have found it incredibly depressing to watch Theresa May look to me not like a leader, but like a follower. She has, as you're saying, followed some of Corbyn's policies, which actually, I don't thoroughly disagree with because I think it's important that we not harden into ideological positions. I want politicians who are trying to solve problems and if that's the right way to solve a problem then great. Don't worry. I'm not saying that I don't think it is the right way to solve the problem in this case but I think it's important to not get locked into ideological positions. What concerns me is that we seem to be entering a, 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 a moment where the positions on both left and right have hardened, hardened to such a degree and have become so extremist and absolutist. And we're starting to demonize the center. I'm literally seeing people saying that centrism is bad, but the common ground is the ground of democracy. And it worries me a lot that we're losing any ability to talk about what that common ground might look like. And I would really, and, and the thing is, is that we've conflated centrism with neoliberalism because neoliberalism owned the center space for such a long time. But there are ways to be centrist without being neoliberal. So I would like to find find somebody who can start to articulate that viewpoint. Okay. Can we, can we just, I come back to members of the audience, can we just ex explore the thing I mentioned earlier, Fraser Nelson saying that the Conservative Party seemed to have abandoned the free market and enterprise and all the rest, and Damien, perhaps you'd like, you've heard what he said. I mean, is there truth well, in well, that? I can, can I answer several, several of the points? Well, not, well you can answer many, many points. But must can be, I be not, very, very, but, but, but first, it's, it's really interesting yes. that people are saying they are disenchanted with both main parties, just after we've had an election where the combined vote of the main parties has been higher than it has been for decades. Actually, what we saw at the general election was, was a coalescence of votes. I mean, the Conservative Party got the most votes and the most seats, but the, the surprise of the election was that the Labour Party got more votes. They swept yeah. up a lot of the left-wing votes from, from Greens and Lib Dems. On, on the specifics, on housing, uh, actually, uh, we, are, we are building a million extra homes by 2020. We've got house building going again. Some of the announcements we made this week were specifically about not just home ownership, which we're deeply committed to, but actually starting to uh, build ha council houses I don't again. want to stop you on that, but we may come to that because I said okay. we had a lot of questions. Okay. Sorry. Can you pick and up on, on what Fraser it, said? On, 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 Fraser, that's, yeah. um, well, I, I think it, it's, it's inevitable that journalists want one, one uh, it wasn't just me, but idea. three or four people here tonight yeah. were saying yeah. the Conservatives do not attract entrepreneurs the way they once did. We have a, a teacher who's a former Conservative who doesn't back them anymore because she doesn't think they stand for anything. Well, that well, is the part, it problem, was, it surely. Was standing for uh, entrepreneurs um, involve uh, a lot of the things we're doing. It's why we have a huge infrastructure fund. What, what people do need to start small businesses is to make sure that the infrastructure uh, of the country is better. And that's why we've got a big infrastructure f uh, fund. It, they, they need, in the end, uh, a low tax economy. The only way we will be able to start cutting taxes for other than people at the bottom end, we have cut taxes for, is to make sure that we bring the deficit down. And we are doing that. We need to live within our means. And when we do that, uh, we can make sure we can continue with policies like cutting corporation tax, which is the single biggest help for business in this country that any government has given for 30 years. And that's why we've got unemployment at the lowest level for 40 years. People say, you know, we've had austerity. Yeah. Of course we've had austerity. But while we've been doing that, we've been able to cut unemployment to historic lows. And that's a huge achievement right. in this country. All right. I go to you, sir, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I was at the Tory party conference and the way it was reported with snaps of problem issues with uh, Theresa May having difficulty with the speech were, were the key items that were reported. There was not an objective reporting. There was no undercurrent of, of disillusionment about Theresa May within the conference. I never heard anybody 
speaking negatively about Theresa May. They all respect and they wish her all the best. There is an air of uncertainty at the moment caused by Brexit because we don't know, want, know what the outcome is going to be of the negotiations and everybody is concerned. Unless, until we know the outcome, then there will be uncertainty. But what I would like to have seen is all the parties working together rather than ha having a, a squabble about... Yeah. The, but on, on Theresa May, you, you don't think this was her last stand? You think she's no, there until the election? No, I think she's here, here for the long term. All right. And I think she's going to do well. The, the woman here in the front, and then we'll go on to a, another question. Uh, uh, still political, but let's just hope it goes. I don't think it's just a question of whether this was Theresa May's last stand, but actually it's quite clear that it was the Conservative Party government's last stand when they didn't address at this conference the key issues that are facing us today, which is seriously uh, underfunding in the police, in education and in our health service. And the other defining issue of our century, which is how on earth we're going to enact this ridiculous decision to leave the European Union, we need... <laughs> these, well, you, these issues... You set a hair running there. <laughs> these issues were completely ignored what? by the Conservative yeah. Party conference. What Brexit was? OK. <laughs> and they came out with nothing substantial. They were extremely policy light. And we yeah, just yeah. don't have any answers from the current government. The, 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 the it's Labour time Party for a change. A debate, and it isn't just the Prime Minister, with due respect to her. It isn't just the Prime Minister, but it's the shambolic lot behind her who are pretending that they know what they're doing okay. when they clearly don't. Let, let's briefly... <laughs> let's, just, let's just turn to... One of, the, one of the lot behind her with a question from Gillian McCulley, please. Gillian. Is Sir Boris Johnson a loose cannon or the Conservative Party's best chance of winning the next election? Mm. Who said best chance? <laughs> you did, sir. Well, explain it. Because it's for Britain. It's for B Boris Johnson. It's for Britain. Oh, sorry? It's for Britain. OK. Oh, that's how I see it, you know what I mean? It just... Take the money out of Europe, keep the money here in Britain. Fraser Nelson, British. you refer to you, you're, you're a Johnsonian. I will confess to being a, a huge fan of Boris Johnson. I mean, he is, OK, loose cannon, you can call him that. But he is a bit different to your normal politician. He doesn't come on thinking of 27 approved things to say. He, you know, says what he thinks. Oh, he makes jokes, not always go down very well, I admit. But the thing about Boris, he, he, he has got this cut through to the ordinary, uh, ordinary voter, which so many politicians don't really have. And he is, you know, of course, because he's such a big character, he is divisive. So you'll get you know, people booing for him, cheering for him. Not many people are neutral on Boris Johnson. But I think as an advocate, he's one of the Conservative Party's greatest assets in making the case for Brexit. He pretty much he did a huge part in inspiring the country to vote for Brexit. He, he sold it. Really. And, and uh, pe uh, people loathe him because of that, but I have to say that he inspires probably more people than, right. than did like him. OK, da da Damien Green. Um, I think Boris is great to have uh, as part of the team. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm still reeling from being told that the Tory party doesn't spend enough time talking about Brexit. Uh, I find that quite hard to believe. Uh, but um, we talked about Europe at the conference, and you know, the country will be talking about it for uh, a long time to come, and it is a, a subject that... Uh, obviously divides people, uh, and I was on the other side uh, of Boris in the, uh, in the referendum campaign. But what I think Boris particularly, does particularly well is inject an air of optimism mm -hmm. uh, into uh, the future of Britain. You know, we, uh, you know, I, as a, as a former, uh, as a Remain campaigner, uh, I think it's my public duty to get the best deal, help get the best deal possible for Britain. Boris absolutely believes to the core of his being that Britain's future is great uh, and that he wants to contribute to that and that he can sprinkle uh, optimism over the Brexit process. And, and that is an as extremely... A, as a supporter of, of, of Theresa May, don't you bridle when he starts laying down conditions about how he'd like to see Brexit well, done, which are different from hers? Well, well, Boris has signed up, as the whole Cabinet did, to the Florence speech and to uh, what we agreed in Cabinet, at a Cabinet meeting, where every Cabinet member uh, was allowed their say. OK, so you said uh, two years means, I quote you, a few months either way. 
after the Florence speech, he says not a second more. Well, That's quite a big distinction, isn't it? The, the, the Florence speech uh, <laughs> uses the phrase around two years, which is what I stick to, what the Cabinet sticks to. That not is Boris, the, that he is the says government not a policy. second more. That's not around. Well, but I, I'm just That's explaining what, what government policy is. It is around two years. It's not the biggest difference in the world. Boris yeah. is always accused of being disloyal and backstabbing, but really, is, is that such a, a big deal? I mean, as, as, as I see <laughs> yes. it, he basically, yeah. it, 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 he's he's articulating that he's, he's selling the government's policy okay. better than pretty much anybody else in the Sarah, country. Sarah Judge. I find it extraordinary that anybody watching Boris Johnson can think that Boris Johnson is for anything other than Boris Johnson. <laughs> I, also, I, I also find it extraordinary that anybody finds his antics and his buffoonery amusing. This is serious stuff. There are really serious issues at stake here. He may, he's an opportunist who makes a case for Brexit and then writes a column making another case in case he lost the election. Um, he's not standing on principles. <coughs> he's not standing up for Theresa May. He literally didn't stand up for Theresa May until Amber Rudd made him. Um, <coughs> and in particular, I have to say specifically, and I don't think we should walk around this, um, the specific comments that he made about Libya, a country that is mired in civil war, and he said it had nice beaches that would be good to invest in once they cleared up the dead bodies. That's not a joke. It's not funny. It's not appropriate for the foreign minister of Great Britain to say he should have been sacked instantly. It's one of the reasons I say Theresa May is a follower and not a leader, that she didn't do that right away. And I find it absolutely despicable that anybody is defending him or defending those comments. Michelle Gilbert. Well, I wouldn't be comfortable with a, a court jester running our country. I don't think that's the right thing for us in any way, shape or form. Um, I do, however, think that we are in an era of personality uh, politics. I think people right across the spectrum um, are wanting people that talk you know, like a normal person and not like a politician. And I think that's one of the reasons that those people who support Boris Johnson support him. I also think it's one of the reasons people support um, Jeremy Corbyn, for example, because they like him or love them. They feel they're authentic. They feel that they're talking their kind of language, etc. Um, I wouldn't tolerate Boris undermining me at every twist and turn if I was Theresa May. I would be severely yanking him back into line, and if he doesn't come back into line, then I would be letting him go. I wouldn't be messing around in any way, shape, or form. You keep saying, is it such a big deal if he's been regarded as backstabbing and all the rest of it? I think it is a big I think it is a big deal. But if you're being accused of something all the time, surely you'd be reflecting, thinking, am I giving this impression? Even if you think you're not doing it. And this 350 million, and I say this as a Brexiteer, the 350 million pound thing he keeps saying, he has to stop saying that. He really does. Okay. The 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 woman in yellow here. I'll come. Hang on. I'll come to somebody. Yeah. You. Um, wouldn't Boris be more of a loose cannon on the back benches? Uh, yeah, but you can sink the whole Tory party, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but remember what loose cannon do, yes. <laughs> you saw in the blue shirt up there, and then there was a voice over here I'll come to. I'll come to you. So yes. in an alternative, re alternative yeah. reality, we've got a loose cannon mediating between Donald Trump and North Korea, and yeah. that's not really a world yeah. I can live in. OK, and you, sir. <laughs> and, uh, do with a few more Borises actually talking the country up than less Ramonas talking the country down. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Angela, Angela Renner. Well, I absolutely agree with everything that Sarah said. I think that Boris has been an absolute embarrassment. He should have uh, he shouldn't be undermining the Prime Minister. The truth is that the Prime Minister is running away from her Cabinet rather than working with her Cabinet at the moment. Boris Johnson, um, his comments on Libya was absolutely disgraceful. And Damien, I found it offensive that you even actually tried to defend him this week, whereas your Justice Minister, Dr Philip Lee, has tweeted saying that anyone decent would condemn his comments, and I absolutely agree with him on that point. What, what I said was that we should all learn. We should all, including Boris, learn to 
use our language sensitively uh, when we're dealing with particularly sensitive subjects. There is um, an irony uh, in this, in that Libya is one of the areas that Boris has done most work on uh, as Foreign Secretary. He's recently visited there. Uh, he knows the situation very well. And the, 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 the point about the, the bodies is that they are uh, ex daesh fighters who are used as IEDs. The Libyan government and matter. thousands of women and children are, died as well. Yes, of course, of, of course there are. But what he was saying was actually that the message is that you know, Libya is going through a completely horrific phase at the moment. But there is the Which glimmer, is there is the glimmer of a possibility of Libya having a good economic future. That was the point he was trying to make. Now, oh. and, and that's true. And I agree, language should always be used sensitively. But it was it's, a message of hope about Libya. You, because he knows you. more about it than most people. You, sir. Boris is a clone. We all know that. But... But it's interesting, he, he actually voted against bombing Libya and he's being castigated by a lot of people who actually voted for, to bomb Libya. And all he has said, he said some silly words, you know, and it's offensive to some people, it's just stupid and crass to other people. But where his actions, and I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a Conservative supporter or, or a supporter of, of Boris Johnson, but his actions, he's actually, you know, put his money where his mouth is when it really comes down to it. Okay, and I'll take That's one more point and then we'll go on. From the woman, the woman there on the gangway, or is it the man on the gangway? Yes, it's you. I thought your arm was hers. No, it, it, uh. it's it's admirable and understandable that you know at the editor and the spectator and uh, Daily Telegraph columnist looks at a former one and thinks maybe I can be prime minister. And I know that's not your ambition, Fraser, but you know what you have to when your oh leading article the other day pre-conference talked about the Conservatives making themselves. Um, more attractive to the aspirational yeah. section of the society. If Boris Johnson is leader of the Conservative Party and he comes to the North West, to marginal seats in the North West, the Midlands, key areas where you need to win, where you, where, where you thought you would win prior to this election, with Boris Johnson as leader, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. I'm See, sorry. I, I, I completely understand, Fraser. And, uh, you, you know, a man, you know, a, a man who puts his you know, friends before the country, that's admirable. However... Is not the answer. He's not just... the answer in the north of England. He's right. not the answer Very briefly, in Fraser. metropolitan areas. All right. It's not the case that like, Boris has got a fan club amongst journalists. This is a guy who won twice London, a Labour city. He had the largest personal mandate in Europe. He's one of the most effective, proven election winners the Conservatives have got. At every stage in his career, they've said, no, Boris, you're too daft to be editor of The Spectator. You're too daft to be London Mayor. You're too daft to be Foreign Secretary. He keep, keep, goes on proving people wrong by his achievements. And it's always amazing how people will focus on some off-colour joke that he made, rather than his incredible record, actually, of unbroken, undefeated success in London. All That's right. more than Don't, a lot of cabinet members let's, can please. All right. Let's... It looks to me as though we're, we're almost halfway through question time, so let's leave Boris mm. to sink or swim on, him, on his own for the moment uh, and go on to another question just before that. Let's have a question. Should we take this, please? Uh, Sarah Roden, your question. Are university degrees really worth in excess of £50,000 worth of debt? OK, we touched on, on this just briefly a moment ago, but let's just go into this, reminding ourselves that Scotland, of course, it doesn't apply to. Lucky old Scots. Um, well, no, actually. What? Uh, no, in Scotland, Wales and a bit. No, no, no it's, it's actually quite bad in Scotland. In Scotland, if you're from a deprived background, you're half as likely to get into university as you are in England. Yeah. And that, so, you know, if you're poor and bright, then England is the place to be rather than Scotland because of a tuition fees policy. Sarah Churchwell, I was going to ask you. I'll come to you <laughs> afterwards. Um, yes, well, as somebody who works in higher education, obviously I have a, a strong view on this. Clearly, I believe that higher education is good for people or I wouldn't be doing it. I also believe that it's good for the public, however. I believe that it is a public good and that it's good for society. Um, there is a lot of evidence that um, peace and prosperity go up in populations with higher education. There are a lot of studies that show that. The question of who pays for the higher education is the important one. I think it's very, very important that we create a society in which the people who are able have access to it, regardless of their background. Personally, I would actually favor, I don't actually think the current system works at all. Um, I think even in America, they, people don't just pay for it themselves. There are scholarships and bursaries and all kinds of state assistance yeah. for good students who can't yeah. afford it. 
So we, ha we have to have a, at least a more flexible system. I, I would not just, just explain why it doesn't work. Well, uh, because I'm sure Damien moment, Green will be defending because it Because at the moment. moment, all of the burden of the debt goes on to the individual. And I'm saying that not even in America does that happen. There are subsidies and there are ways that the individual doesn't necessarily pay the whole burden. What, um, what many of the... America is such a big, complicated place that there are many different systems. But in some of the places, they have what is effectively a means-tested system. And I would... Um, I personally would support that, where people who can afford to pay for it should, and subsidize yeah, exactly. those who are not able okay. to pay for it themselves, and at least lessen the debt burden, if not be able to eliminate it altogether, and there should definitely also be state support. So I would, I would personally support a combination of ways of funding it, instead of this always an attempt to find a one-size-fits-all model, and they don't work. Okay. Uh, Damien Green. I think the, I, the, the bit I, I disagree with Sarah, she says it doesn't work at all, because Fraser made the point that actually we've got more students from disadvantaged backgrounds mm -hmm. going to university in, in England mm -hmm. than ever before. So that's a bit of the system that works. And, and I think we should establish uh, a couple of principles, first of which is that uh, while uh, student, higher education students should get some support from the state, they should also contribute something when they themselves. Can when they can, and, that's, and, and when they can was a key point of uh, some of the announcements we made at conference, uh, raising the level at which people have to start paying back the debt from 21,000 to 25,000 and freezing uh, the current fees levels. But there are significant problems in the system, one of which is, and, and it, it goes directly to the original question we were asked about, is higher education a good thing? It's clearly a good thing for some people. Uh, equally clearly, for other people, it can be a waste of time and money and they might well be better off getting other types of qualifications that they could get faster uh, and which would set them up better for life. So one of the things we'll be looking at in, in, in a review we're doing is first of all why is every university course uh, set at £9,000? When it was originally put in there was meant to be a market operating so that if you are doing a, a, a top level course at a top level university, okay fine, you, you pay top of the range money, but that there should be a range of courses and that hasn't happened why at not? all. And that why not? Good happen? question, that's why we're having uh, a review. One of the answers... Well, hang on, you one introduced of, it. One, so one, why, of the, one of the, well, the Labour Party introduced tuition yeah, fees actually. You, you but you but one, of the, kept them. one of the, one, what, what a Vice Chancellor has told me, uh, which is interesting, is that they had thought about uh, introducing uh, lower fee courses uh, and they found that nobody was going to apply for them. But it's, it's become one of those goods that the, the more you charge, the more prestigious it sounds. So the more people pay for them. Now, clearly that's wrong, uh, so, so that shouldn't be happening. And, and so we need to get rid of that. But also, we need uh, to increase the efficiency of the sector. So uh, why does every university course have to take at least three years? Uh, maybe there are courses that you could do faster than that. So you have different types of courses. You have maybe more emphasis for some people on non-higher education courses, which should do the more good and you would have a much right. more flexible system to give more chance to more young people. Thank you. I'll come to you. As the mother of two uh, children in their early 20s who went to university and I fully supported their decision to do that, my younger son fell within the £9,000 tuition band and now has a debt of £40,000. Now, he's lucky enough to have a job. He lives in London. Both my children live in London. But it does worry me that they're, they're paying off this enormous debt, and, and how will they ever um, achieve secure housing? How will they ever save for a pension? And so on. OK. Um, <laughs> Angela Rayner. Well, it's completely unsustainable to expect our young people to leave universities in... £50,000 worth of debt. And I have to challenge Damien on the fact that more working class and more mm. disadvantaged people are going to university because more people are going to university, but percentage-wise, yeah. there's less coming from working yeah, class no, backgrounds if you true. take it as a proportion of the percentage of those that are in. And day. more than ever, people are dropping out of university at record levels. So there is a problem with the current system. Our National Education Service was absolutely clear that it would be free at the point of use and it is a public good for everybody Absolutely. to get that education and for businesses and for Britain to prosper and our economy to prosper we need people to be educated and going into not just our universities but going into further education colleges and technical education which is what our plan was about the um, the, the, f <laughs> the, um, 
the, the, I don't want to bandy figures with you, but the UCAS figures showed that the gap between the most and least advantage has fallen since 2006, from 39 yeah. Yeah. to 35%. So when you say the opposite is happening, you appear to be saying the opposite of what the okay. facts suggest. The, the figures are quite clear that more people than ever are going to university, so therefore the more the people from disadvantaged backgrounds is more going okay. to university, but that's because the numbers have increased of the amount of people going to university. But as that's well as what that, the figures say. And Damien, more people, people are, are leaving university. They're not able to stay on because you abolished maintenance grants and because people are now leaving with unsustainable right. levels there of debt. Of and the fact that you've gone back on that today, let's be honest, the reason that you have decided to cap tuition fees is because you know that you lost the no, vote you, in Parliament. You, you, you you've lost you the said. argument. You this. said, Jeremy Corbyn said at the election that Labour would deal with student debt. So your children, like mine, who are in their 20s, uh, who have got student debt, Labour promised at the election uh, that they would wipe out that debt. No, we didn't Angela, say who's it. a sensible woman, has said since, no, we, we never said that. that. You can see the tweets you from said Labour. I, I said I'll deal with it. He said, I'm sorry I'll I keep reading it. these things to you, but Jeremy Corbyn said, uh, I don't see why those who had the misfortune to be at university during the £9,000 period should be burdened excessively compared to those that went before or those that come after. I will deal with it. He also said... In that what do you mean? No, that's what he said. David, I don't know what he also said. He, 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 said, he said in that... But you're quoting one little element of a whole... <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. And Sorry. he said that he would ameliorate it and he would look he at it. He said he'd but he said it. that he'd had two weeks before the general election was yes. announced and that he would and look two into weeks it. weeks after, you he said would, he wouldn't. He would look into it. It was not in our manifesto. Damien, most of your manifesto's been ripped up. You've ripped it all up. You're not doing anything but that you promised, despite the fact that the gentleman okay. earlier said you won the election. I want to go... Hold on. A lot of people want to speak. I'd like to go to Sarah Roden, though, who asked the question first of all. Sarah, what do you think of what you've heard so far? I think, um, Sarah, you would obviously have an interest in promoting higher education. It's your industry, isn't it? It'd be like me working for a, a car company and not recommending that people drove cars. I think we need to look at it in a broader <laughs> sense. I think what Damien said about the possibility of two-year degrees, I don't know how, how many hours first-year students do nowadays, but I used to have to go in for 10 hours a week. Really, I probably could have compressed that degree into two yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. that'd be much more sensible. Yeah. You, you, the man on the, on the gangway there, you say, yes. Can I just say one thing? I am just a, one. I'm a student, and I, I very much understand uh, the amount of fees and the debt that I will get into, but what Labour is saying about the number of poor people going to university and how it's decreased, it, it's a lie. There's no, there's no other way around it. You are lying. You are lying. I didn't say you it did. decreased. No, you did. You are saying... I didn't. Yes, you're saying that the, the gap has decreased. You've said the that the gap... The numbers. The gap between the top and the bottom has decreased. I it said, has. Let, let me be absolutely clear, what I've said is more people Please. than ever are going to university. So, therefore, more people from disadvantaged but backgrounds are going to university. It's but percentage-wise, in terms of the proportion that was going before, it is decreased compared no, to the overall number. It's, that's what that's I'm saying. No, no. All right. Uh, OK. Uh, Michelle. So, I think university absolutely has a place. If you want to be a brain surgeon, whatever, university is the path. Excellent. But I'm always confused by why we keep saying this sentence, more people than ever are going to university, as though that is the most important thing, because I worry that we're getting overly obsessed with universities and that universities are becoming almost like the only definition of success and the only kind of description of intellect and demonstration of intellect. And what, what the, where I see the problem with this is you need to be careful that degrees are not getting devalued in the workplace because the more and more people that go to university, the less special it becomes having a degree. And when you've got somebody going to university, for example, to study business studies, um, I would say that if you want to get into business, one of the best things that you can do is what I did. I did an, an apprenticeship, a YTS as it was <laughs> called, when I was 17 years old. It was the best thing I've, I've ever done and I owe my career to it. It gave me a wage, albeit not a great one. It gave me qualifications and crucially, and this is what helped develop my career, it gave me experience, confidence, 
contacts, etc. So I just think we've got to be a little bit careful of lauding and celebrating university as this great thing and dismissing kind of vocational education and alternate routes so because when, they when, are equally as valuable. When you're employing, yeah. Yeah. You're getting... You're getting a lot, of, a lot of applause for that. When you employ people, then, do you not go for people with a business degree, MBA, or something like that? You'd rather have somebody with practical experience so of some I, kind? I do a number of things, one of which I have a recruitment company, and people will just say, or, oh, they, yeah, they've got to have a 2-1, they've got to have a 2-1. They'll just add it as a, as a basic requirement, as a filtering thing. And what's happening is that jobs that you used to be able to get into without a degree, all of a sudden, you need this degree to get into a job that you could have got into before. Then I see all of these graduates coming to me that are struggling to get work because they have no experience. And it's this catch-22 situation. So what I would like to say is, of course, university has its place. And of course, it's valuable to certain professions. Right. But it is not the only way forward, I promise you. All right, I'll come to you. I'll come back to you. Please, or you'll be spoken. Yeah. Um, for what it's worth, at the Spectator, when we take interns or recruits, we say, don't even send us your CV. Just do an aptitude test. We don't care whether you went to university. We don't, it doesn't, all that matters is if you can do it. And I think there has been, over the years, this obsession with going to university. And I think you know, your question was, you know, is it worth 50 grand of debt? Well, for some students in some universities it is, but for a lot of them it isn't. Students aren't really told that. They're told if you go to university, you're going to earn 100 grand more than a non-graduate. And those figures aren't really true. If, when you tear them apart, you can actually see that outside the Russell Group universities, the premium is really quite low. So a lot of children are being missold universities right now by the government, and I think they're being actually misled. Now, we're beginning to see now figures about how many people earn and what various courses, and there are some courses where there is no graduate premium at all. And if these pupils had known that before they applied, maybe they would have done something like and, Michelle and was talking about. Do you think it's very onerous, the, the repayment system? Because some people say, well, actually... It's paid over so many years or it, it gets for forgiven after a period. Yes, it's not you really... think it's a burden or not? It is not a debt. That's the, it gets written off completely after a certain number of years. You only play a certain portion of it. I mean, it, young people will... Something like... I think it's only something like a third of students will actually repay the whole thing. And a good number of them won't have to repay the whole thing. You said at the back. It's already, <clears throat> it's already possible to go to university for zero tuition fees. It's called decree apprenticeships. Yeah. It's a conservative policy. It was launched a couple of years ago. I have two people doing degree apprenticeships in my company, company two degree apprenticeship quantity surveyors. It's zero tuition fees. They can do it in three years, exactly the same as the university. It's the same course content, the same tuition. It's exactly the same. Okay. It's funded by a 1% levy on big business. It's brilliant. Why is nobody talking about this? Yeah. It's your policy. Let young people know. Shame on you, shame on you. No, I don't. I'll happily talk to all our very good the, the, the woman in the middle there. Yes. I think there are two issues. Where universities are offering degree apprenticeships, it can be great, but there aren't enough. And the policy of introducing as an alternative hasn't come to fruition at the speed it should have done to provide a genuine alternative. I think the things that Michelle has described as the characteristics that you develop through entrepreneurial, independent work and so on are delivered through university degrees. And it's about time we looked at not just the cap, um, but also the interest rate that's charged on the debt. And it is a debt, Fraser. It is a burden for many people. They panic about it. They worry about it. Um, it casts a shadow over work. Right. And I think an interest rate that is so much higher than mortgage rate, savings rate, is just not, um, uh, you know, justifiable. All right. Well, let, uh, we'll go on, but just a last, a last word from our, from our university yeah, professor on you. the table um, here. I, I, first of all, I just need to say um, to, the, to Sarah, it's easy to remember your name, Sarah, um, to Sarah's point about um, my uh, being like a car salesman selling a degree. I don't get a commission when I get somebody to go to university, right? There's no actual benefit that accrues to me. Um, and it, it's important to say here that 
all of most of this conversation has been about what value degrees have in the marketplace afterwards. Now that is a very real consideration, of course. People need jobs and we're talking about something that has a cost and that there's an investment um, one hopes and the question of what one gets on the other end of it. But I am talking about education as a good in itself. Education is a good in itself. And I absolutely agree with Michelle that formal education is not the only way to get educated. And I absolutely agree that university education is not for everyone. But what I'm saying is that we need a system where the people who want to go to university and are, and are qualified for university, and that's what they want to be doing, should not be intimidated out of it, as the lady up there said, should not worry about the way that the fees are going to hang over their heads. And we have to have a more flexible system. And absolutely, that doesn't say to people the only way you can get on in the world is to go to university. If it's not for you, it's not for you, and you shouldn't do it. OK. I'm sorry. We've, I think we should go on. Thank you very much. Do another, another question. We've had quite a lot of questions on this topic, and this one is from Ian Gardner, please. Mr Gardner. Do the panel believe that Catalonia should be given independence from Spain? And obviously has echoes of the United Kingdom as well hanging over it. Fraser Nelson, do you believe Catalonia should be given independence? Well, I, it's difficult to tell because there's this sort of referendum which was obviously like boycotted by those who don't believe in independence. So you can't really take the figures to prove that they want independence. The polls um, are inconclusive, really. And I think if you look at those who did vote for independence, they amounted to something like 30% of the electorate in Catalonia. So there is not enough ground to say that they want it to happen. But that said, I think the way the Spanish government have handled it has been absolutely appalling. Mm. I mean, if they, they took the view that, um, you know, that, that, that sending the police in to take away these ballot boxes, and what was that going to do other than increase support for separation? I think if you compare the way that we did our referendum in Britain a few years ago, if, the, if, if my fellow Scots had voted for independence, I think most English people would think, well, it's a shame to see you go, but if that's what you want, then do it. But in Spain, it's very different. You get a lot of popular opinion in Spain is absolutely against any idea of self-determination for the Catalans. Now, I'm a unionist, but I do believe in self-determination, and most Scots want to stay in the union. I'm very glad they chose that. But I think it's just so important to make sure it's a free choice. And the moment people start to think it's not a free choice, when you start to get kind of the ugly politics that we've started to see in Catalonia recently, and I think it's just a, a tragedy for Spain, and that made this problem worse rather than better. OK. Um, Ian Gardner, what do you think? I think it should be given the opportunity to have a referendum Absolutely. the way Scotland did. Right. And you, sir, what do you think? The man on the gangway there. Uh, um, I think the worrying thing for me is the silence from the media about the, um, the events in Barcelona and the way that the people were treated by the police. And the silence in which media? In the Spanish media? Well, in all media, there's very little been said. In fact, on the BBC, um, they reported it as clashes between protesters or voters and the police. It, there was no aggression, on the, from what I could see, on the side of the, the people who were going to vote. OK, and um, you at the back there, yes. Uh, what I think is more concerning as well with the um, violence in the Castellan is the EU's lack of response or condemnation of it as well. And considering we've got to, we've got to negotiate with these same people about the exact same subject. What would you like to see the EU do? Well, Spain's a member state of the EU, so you would have thought it would have been in their remit to do something, uh, or at least say something. Angela Rayner? Well, I absolutely agree. I thought, as a European country, to see the sight of the state police battening and using violence against their own citizens was absolutely despicable and didn't do them any favours whatsoever in terms of the divisions on whether there should be a referendum or not. I think Frazier said it quite well in terms of two years ago, there was an election in uh, Catalonia, in Spain, and the party that stood on the ticket of independence didn't actually, they got 48% of the vote, they didn't get um, a majority vote. So I think, you know, there is divisions there, and, but the way that the um, Spanish state has dealt with it, quite frankly, has made it worse and not better. And the fact that they're not even prepared to mediate with the Catalonian PM and the government, I think it's just making matters mm. worse. 48% just like the Brexit remain yes. vote was. And the EU's lack of comment? Uh, EU lack of comment is disgusting. They should speak out. It's an EU country. We shouldn't be condoning state violence against their citizens. It's appalling. You, you in, in the 
the third I think, given the actions of the Spanish government, there should be no question that if there were to be a legitimate referendum held with no state interference, then they would vote to leave. Right. Mi um, Michelle. So I think the initial question was, should they be um, independent? What should I they be granted independence? Yes. Yeah, so what I would say is they should be granted a legal opportunity to do a fair proper and binding referendum. A binding referendum? Yeah, I think so what's going on So the Spanish the government has to agree to the possibility that Catalonia will become independent? Yeah, I think what yeah. they need to do is amend their constitution to allow there to be a, a legal referendum. I think the problem at the moment is this side, Spain is saying this isn't legal. These sides are saying, well, we're going to do it anyway. We've got conversations around, well, in the next couple of days, we're just going to see ourselves independent anyway. I know, I know somebody who lives in Barcelona at the moment. She is incredibly, incredibly scared. So what, um, what's getting represented in the media is, depending on what media you look at, not always showing the situation as it is. Um, you know, somebody that I know, they are against independence, but what they're describing to me is a very strong sense of almost intimidation and bullying to make them say, you know, we are, we're going to support this independence, and it's worrying. But I do believe that everyone should be given the opportunity to, to have a say in their future. That should be legally respected, and what they decide to do with their country and their future is up to them. All right. Damien Green, do you agree with that? I think uh, I agree with uh, everyone's point about violence. There is something uh, particularly disturbing but about... Self-determination, as about, Michelle was about saying. ..about seeing police officers drag ballot boxes uh, out of a referendum. That, that, that feels very uncomfortable uh, in a democratic country. Uh, but I also feel quite strongly that the thing that hasn't been reflected in this, um, that it's, it's not for Brits to tell the Spaniards and, indeed, the Catalonians uh, what to do uh, with their constitution. We, we would resent it deeply if uh, other countries told us how to do that, or indeed, or indeed, or I, I, I do condemn the violence, or indeed uh, the EU. I'm, I'm fascinated that everyone wants, wants the EU uh, to step into uh, a member state. Um, it, it, yeah, that would have sensitivities in this country as well. So I think you know, the best we can uh, do as a, as a country, and, and certainly as a government, uh, is, is to you know, urge calm uh, and express the hope uh, that actually this big emotional historic uh, problem can be dealt with calmly and democratically for the future. There okay. has been some, uh, con there has right. been some condemnation. Well, Giva Hogstadt, for example, he did come out and say that the violence was wrong, but there's definitely not been a strong, coordinated EU response. Okay. I'd agree with that for sure. Right. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, Sarah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, uh, just briefly. I'm not an also. We're, we're all After agreed, I, clearly, that, you know, beating people to get them to stay into your country is not a winning proposition. Um, and, I mean, I actually watched, to, to, the, to the man's point about media, I actually watched um, a horrifying video of a, of a policeman breaking a young woman's fingers one by one. I mean, there was really sadistic violence happening on the ground there. And there was a young man who responded with a sign that said, I don't want independence, but I won't stand by while you beat my people. What they're doing is radicalizing people. Yeah. So I can't understand for the life of me why, that while taking Damien's point that we don't intervene in, in, um, in their constitutional issues, I can't understand for the life of me why the Spanish government didn't just, didn't do something in between the two, like say, you're in contempt of court and we're going to hold the leaders in contempt of court okay. for holding an, uh, an illegal referendum, for example. There are all, all kinds right. of peaceful ways of dealing with this legally because they were, they were ordered not to hold the referendum, but you have, have the debate, have the conversation. Don't start beating people. Okay, now look, uh, we've only got four or five minutes left. We've got four big questions. I'm going to take... I know, I know, I know. Somebody said earlier, why can't we go on from now? I'm going to take just one, but get to the heart of it, uh, uh, if we can. Kevin Fitton, your question, please. Yes, uh, should we turbocharge the house-building programme uh, by ditching uh, HS2? Right, and that's the point. Should we just get rid of one of the great capital, £56 billion on HS2, and spend the lot on housing? And we have four minutes to go round the panel to debate it. <laughs> OK, you'll have to be quick. You start, Michelle. I've always been slightly on the fence with, with HS2, which is not like me. I'm not normally on the fence. Um, but I'm certainly not on the fence when it comes to providing proper, safe, affordable housing for people to live in. 
We absolutely need to be accelerating the programme. What Theresa May described in the conference a couple of days ago was not sufficient, so we should be accelerating that. So you have £56 billion to add to the £2 billion that they added at the conference. Fraser Nelson. I think HS2 is a monumental waste of money, and I can't believe... Um... <laughs> Like there, are, there are so many things, better ways you could spend that money. But if you want to kickstart housing, then you shouldn't have government building houses. Government needs to give permission, planning permission. That's the constraint. It's not a lack of money. So okay. what the government should do is just overrule the councils that don't that forbid planning permission. That's how to turbocharge it. You need more private supply, not more government money. Okay. HS2 on the back bench. On the back burner, rather, not the back benches. Angela Rayner, <laughs> well, you, you're keeping going with HS2, aren't well, you? Well, I'd be really concerned. HS2 is the only thing that the North East seem to be getting at the moment. I'd cancel something the, the South and London controversy as a Northern MP. I'd say we need some more investment in our transport in the North. We've not had that investment. But, you know... Turbo. Turbo charging the, the house building. We need more council We need more social housing that would bring down homelessness. It would bring down the rent rises that we're having to pay for for people who are on welfare that we're paying housing benefit to. We need more social housing. So and the two billion HS2. and the five thousand a year is going to do nothing to help. So that abolish market. HS2, yes or no? No, no. But okay, get the fine. money Damien somewhere Green. else. H HS2 will be a huge benefit to this part of the world. I'd be fascinated to know which London projects uh, you want to ban, and, and, and you, I'm sure you'll well, explain you that. Yeah, yeah, just, just, just focus housing, on that very briefly. Housing is, is, is absolutely important, and that's why uh, in the housing white paper we, we deal with it in everything. You've got to both uh, ensure councils have the land to build. You've got to make sure that house builders who have planning permission actually build the homes. Uh, and we're looking at the best ways to do that. And why can't the government, can money. Why can't the the government, government is... build? Why can't they use? That's the point of the question. You've but, got £56 billion. Pounds. Why didn't you just well, start I, building I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't spend that £56 billion because I think HS2 is an extremely good idea. And we are starting building houses. We've actually built more council houses over the past seven years than Labour did right, in their 13 okay. years in power. And we're going to build more still over the next three Sarah. years.